All right, so <clears throat> describe the Doolittle Raid on Tokyo. Explain the risk and objective of this mission. And then finally, explain the importance of the Battle of Coral Sea. So yesterday, we talked about these two events. We mentioned about how this is building momentum for the United States as we're gaining some traction here now, finally, down in Southeast Asia and Pacific. All right, there you go. Join in. No interest.
All right. Okay. So the Doolittle raid. Describe it. What's going on here? What happened? What happened? Connor, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, in regard to the law of the Supreme Father of Tokyo, the more or less affected morale of the Japanese. Yeah, good job, right? And boost the United States, right? So for that, okay, this was more of a mission, a top secret mission here to uh, try to boost morale in the U.S. To try to get some sort of traction here for us and to show Japan that we can strike them at any moment, at any time, right? So with the USS Hornet, the goal is to try to get as close as possible to Tokyo, right, to Japan, the mainland, and launch these bombers off the flight deck. But what was up with these bombers? Were they designed to be launched off an aircraft carrier? No, they weren't. And it was going to be a difficult task to even just get them off the aircraft carrier, right? But uh, even still, right, they continue with the mission, even with the Japanese patrol boat being way out in the waters, and they had to actually send off a little bit further out than they did they, uh, what was designed, what was planned. So as they were making this trip, well, one of the realities is that they might run out of fuel. Okay, a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the pilots here were realizing that with the heavy bay blow, the bombs that were on the planes, Okay, this was going to be a daunting task, a huge objective to try to accomplish. So as they're flying into Japan, about 400 miles out, right? Okay, as they target Tokyo, did it cause a lot of destruction? Not really, right? But again, this was a way to try to boost morale and to show Japan that we can strike them at any moment. So this was a huge objective. This was a huge win, right? A mission for the U.S. All right, so as they attacked Tokyo, they bombed it. Okay, again, causing some destruction, but not a total lot, right? Oh. Okay, and uh, the next part of the mission was trying to land where? Where they want to land? Where they try to land here? Some of them made it, and unfortunately, some did not. Go ahead, Zach Morris. Uh, yeah, good job, right? So, friendly China. But we already mentioned, too, with the eastern coast of China, who controlled it? Who dominated it? Connor. Yeah. yeah, the Japanese, right? So, the goal was to try to get past what was already controlled by the Japanese. As you're making the flight, well, a lot of the airmen actually had to parachute out, okay, and let the plane just roll down because they ran out of fuel. And so a lot of them, obviously most of them, jumped out of the plane and they crash landed. Okay, one of the planes did crash land where three uh, servicemen, three pilots were killed, three airmen were killed, and uh, a few more, around eight, I believe eight to ten, were captured by the Japanese. But overall, this mission was successful. Again, it proved that Japan, right, uh, we can target Japan at any moment, and this was a boost of morale for the United States at home. Okay. Again, we took a, a, a huge loss at Pearl Harbor and losing the Philippines okay, right around this time. Right. This was uh, showing that we weren't maybe prepared for this war, you know, we're taking our lumps or losses. Finally, we have something Navy power chest on for the new little raid. Okay, all right. Uh, what about the Battle of Coral City? Why was this so important? Paul, go ahead. America has lost in the Japanese way could have history the way that Australia and if they lost Australia they would have no friends in the Pacific. Yeah, good job, right? So you're looking at all the islands here and what was controlled by the United States, the Philippines, all they lost that. Next part it was Australia here. Okay, this was controlled by the Allied powers and territory for Great Britain for a long time here now at this point. And the US loses Australia. Well, there's no launching point, there's no vantage point for the United States to try to push Japan back. So in Southeast Asia here, the Pacific would be just fully dominated and controlled by Japan. Right? The only islands we would have really is Midway and then Hawaii. But yeah, they took Guam too, I forgot to mention that. So Guam was another territory here out here in the Pacific Ocean right? that we acquired after the Spanish American War. Well, the Japanese took Guam. Jeez. Okay, so by 1942, it really looked like they were controlling much of this theater of war. So with Coral Sea, this was a way for us to try to stop the advancement of Japan, right? Stop them in their tracks, okay? And uh, why else was this battle so significant? So first time we stopped them to deter their movements. Why else was it so important? Why? It was the first uh, aircraft, aircraft carrier battle. Yeah, good job, right? So out in the open water, okay, these floating fortresses, literally, right? These aircraft carriers. Out in the open water and dog fights with airplanes out uh, above the water, above the surface of the water. Okay, again, it wasn't like your traditional naval battle where you have these battleships just launching artillery at one another until the one sinks. Nope, this was all fighting done with planes that were fighting over top of these aircraft carriers, trying to target many of these other ships with airplanes. So, yeah, this is changing naval warfare for us. 
So much so that even today we invest a lot of time, resources, money into creating these aircraft carriers, which the United States has about 13 nuclear powered aircraft carriers. So that's obviously important, right? And with naval warfare, it's more about power projection, how far you can actually target your enemy, right, from further distances. The idea that the use of battleships, yeah, we still create them, you know, they're still out there in the water, but for the most part, aircraft carriers are the way to go. All right, is there any questions? Okay, yesterday we did talk a little bit about more of our modern fleet, what it looks like, how it is compared to other countries around the world. And hopefully, again, we don't have to use it, which it's one of those one of those things with these events that are emerging with China and Taiwan today. Well, there's a lot of questions whether or not we actually might uh, get involved here when it comes to trying to defend Taiwan from China. So hopefully it doesn't get to that point, but we'll see tensions are rising each and every day over the island of Taiwan. Okay, all right, so now we're gonna shift, we're gonna transition back to the European theater. Okay, I don't like doing that, but when it comes to the timeline of events, it's, I think, works the best when it comes to discussing about these certain matters and knowing about certain events and battles that take place. So we're shifting back to the European theater. All right. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right, so two terms, Operation Barbarossa and the Siege of Leningrad. There you go. So I do want to focus on the Siege of Leningrad because we did talk about the city already. Anybody remember the first name of this city here? Honor. St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg. Yep, good job. So yeah, it changes names over time, right? And it will change its name back to St. Petersburg. But okay, after obviously Lenin comes around, creates this communist regime in the Soviet Union, they change the name to Leningrad. All right, so we'll talk about this siege today. How brutal it was for the Soviets facing the advancing German army. Okay, the Vermont.
All right, okay, so Operation Barbarossa, what was this here? What was this? Why, go ahead. Yeah, good job, right? So this is Germany's planned invasion of the Soviet Union. Okay, and we mentioned already with Germany, okay, with Hitler, the Nazis, right? Their true enemy is communism, okay? And okay, they blame obviously Jews and for communists just as much. And that was the next target for Hitler and the Nazis. All right, so we left off in Europe talking about Germany's advancement in the West. So, yeah, they overtook France, no problem. Okay, remember we talked about how they had France surrender in the same wagon, the same rail car, as Germany surrendered in World War I. Okay, we also talked about, right, with Germany, okay, they, uh, well, with Hitler, taking pictures in front of the Eiffel Tower and different other locations to try to build nationalism up in Germany. We also mentioned about their targeting Great Britain. Did they invade Great Britain? What was that operation called? You guys remember? Paul? Yeah, Operation Sea Lion. Good job. And why did it happen? Why did they actually invade Great Britain? Connor? Because it determined to be too costly. Yeah, good job, right? So when it comes to the resources needed to try to actually invade Great Britain and uh, try to send these troops across the English Channel, well, it will be very costly. Okay. Imagine exactly how much. Uh, you know, power they would need, especially when it comes to trying to take out their Royal Navy, it'd be almost impossible to do. Great Britain still had a strong navy at the time. All right, so rather than trying to invade Great Britain, what did they do? They launched the what? What was that called? So these airstrikes all throughout Great Britain. Bat. So Blitz, yeah, good job. So short for Blitzkrieg, okay, using this lightning warfare, the Luftwaffe, to target many key cities all throughout Great Britain, trying to crush the morale of the British people. What did they give up? No. Who held strong? Who kind of advised the, the British people to not surrender, never give up? Connor. Churchill. Winston Churchill. Yep, good job. And he's been begging the United States to try to help and assist them in many ways. But again, what were those acts called that prevented the U.S. from trading with Great Britain, helping them? The Harvard Neutrality Act. The Neutrality Act. Yep, good job. But by 1941 here, after Pearl Harbor, well, the United States is getting involved in the war. Now the U.S. can help assist Great Britain, fighting back and try to gain land back here in Europe and try to break this Atlantic wall that Germany acquired, right? So by 1942, this is what the map really looks like when it comes to Germany's control in Europe, okay, in North Africa. Yeah, obviously Italy is there with them, but and Japan over in the Pacific. So you can see exactly how much power, how much land, and how much of uh, territory that the Axis powers have at their height. Okay, from here on out, we'll mention that it's going to regress, that eventually the Allied powers will push okay, Germany and Japan back to their main borders. So this is at the height of the Axis control, the Axis power. Right? But before we get to this, pushing them back, right? Operation Barbarossa was the largest invasion ever in history. And over 2 million German soldiers launch this offensive to try to overtake the Soviet Union, to try to uh, really evade deep far into the Soviet Union and take the resources that are abundant here in Russia, especially when it comes to oil, right? So for Germany, if they want to have a long lasting war here, have a long control of Europe, well, they need to defend themselves from Great Britain, from the United States. The only way they can do that is if they have more living space, breathing room. Right, for the Aryan culture, this Laban problem. Right? And at the same time, okay, if they have these resources of food and oil, right, they can continue this war for a long time and defend their land, right? Defend Europe from the attack of the United States and Great Britain. What's up, why? Why does it show Hitler under the axis control? Um it's a good question. I mean, Germany did invade into Finland, but or just, it, it really wasn't there. That's a good question. Maybe I should update that. 
to work. Okay, so anyway, with Operation Barbarossa, over two million men, German soldiers, invaded the Soviet Union. Okay, this is the largest invasion that, again, the world's ever seen. Okay, this is a large span, right? A long span. Look at this, how far this is. But the German army pushes deep, deep into the Soviet Union and gets very close to overtaking Moscow, right? The capital of the Soviet Union. Right? If they would have done that, chances are, well, obviously they would have maybe won this war, but you think Stalin's not going to ever give up? You think he's ever going to surrender? No. Right? And think about it. Up to this point, the Soviet Union and Germany had somewhat of an agreement, right? What was that treaty called again? Where they had this non aggression pact. Remember? Why go to Yeah, the Molotov Ribbentrop pact. Good, good. So, with that treaty here, this was an alliance somewhat. I won't say it was a total alliance, but this was a means of trying to prevent war between two powers. But again, does Hitler follow any of these treaties? No. Treaty of Versailles, forget about it. The Munich Agreement, forget about it. And now here with the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, forget about it, right? So again, the Soviet Union, they're in communism, far left, and fascism, far right. Hitler hates the communists. So you gotta imagine sooner or later, he was gonna turn his back, right, on the Soviet Union. Remember those political cartoons? Well, right, remember they're shaking hands, but at the same time, they had guns behind their back showing that this wouldn't last too long. And this is exactly what occurred. But with these blitzkrieg attacks, Germany really dives deep into the Soviet Union. So much so that it looked like they were going to win this war and really defeat the Soviet Union pretty quick by 1942. Right? And they launched this offensive really in the summer, okay, late summer, and uh, Moving into the closer into uh, early fall. So, with that, it's, I don't know, it looks like it's about time that the Soviet Union is going to surrender. But as Hitler's moving into the Soviet Union, he directs his attention to two key locations. One of them is Leningrad, and the other is, does anybody, which is going to be the turning point here. That, so, uh, well, yeah, he goes to Moscow, but he shifts from Moscow. He tries to transition, pivots away. Uh, what is it, Chris? Yeah, good job. The caucus region, right? And that's where Stalingrad will be located. That is the, the uh, city that is obviously the doorway to the caucus region where all this oil is located, all this resources that fuel his army from here on out. All right, so he pivots to those two locations. Why? Why Leningrad? Why Stalingrad? It's number one, it's Zane, right? So what do you think? Right. The names in the cities, Leningrad, they obviously we talked about Vladimir Lenin already, the king of the Bolshevik Revolution, and Stalingrad, named after Stalin. So this would be a huge morale booster for, for the uh, Germans, and for the Soviets, well, it would crush, uh, crush their momentum, crush their morale. Right? And at the same time, these are two key industrial locations, right? especially right with St. Petersburg, Leningrad. Remember, this was the city built on bones. Remember talking about that with Peter the Great? And uh, how that would crush the morale. Remember that Winter Palace? Remember that? How beautiful it was? Yeah, right? If they capture that, then that's going to be a big national uh, nationalism, obviously, for Germany. And for Stalingrad, again, yeah, not only does it bear the name Stalin, but it also is the key to the Caucasus region, where all this oil is located, where they can use this and fuel their army from, or really, ever. So, yeah, that's why these two locations are important. Okay. And we'll mention here with Stalingrad more tomorrow how this is the turning point eventually for the Soviet Union, but it comes to heavy, heavy loss. And that fact that the battle was one of the bloodiest ever in world history when it comes to how many people died, how many casualties there were for it, and just the cost and overtaking of both sides of the key city. Now, like I said, with the movie that will maybe watch, hopefully, we'll see. Right? With, that, uh, with that key city, we'll talk about how Vasily Zaitsev, a Soviet sniper, gains a strong title, right? And how this battle was so gruesome. All right, so with the Soviets, they're getting pushed back. And with the siege of Leningrad, next thing I want to mention, okay, Leningrad, obviously, we know it's named after Vladimir Lenin. The Germans can capture it. Right? There's going to be a huge building of confidence of nationalism for the German army. So rather than overtaking it, though, they want to keep their movement. They want to keep moving on. Okay, and let's face it, there'd be a lot of casualties, a lot of deaths when trying to take this city. So rather than take it, he decides, Hitler, to encircle it, to try to cut it off from any resources coming in and out. And where St. Petersburg is located, Leningrad, 
to all the way up here at the top of the Soviet Union. Now, you can imagine it's it pretty cold there, right? Okay. So in some at some locations, obviously in the winter, it gets to 30, negative 30 degrees. Negative 30 degrees. And with the Germans cutting off resources and fuel, well, there's just no way for these people to heat their homes. And so much so that through the course of the war, which we'll talk about by 1943, 1944, when the Soviets finally pushed the Germans out of this location, over a million people died of starvation, of some artillery shelling. Okay, but at the same time, those more of starvation, the Germans just encircled the city and cut it off. Okay, and this was one of the most brutal sieges of all time. Okay, as over a million Soviets died just with the encirclement of the city. So you can kind of see where it starts, what we talked about with Peter the Great, city built on bones, and where it's at now, right, with World War II. So overall, this is a brutal encirclement uh, for much over a year, two years, when Germany surrounded the city. All right, so by 1942, again, you can see that the Axis powers have a strong control, right? From here, though, which we'll talk about tomorrow, the Allied powers will kick back, right? We'll see them transition. Right, we'll see them actually gaining a lot of momentum, not only in Europe, but in the Pacific when we talk about Midway Islands and the Midway, the Battle of Midway here soon enough. All right. Is there any questions? Any questions? I believe Finland's actually red because the Soviets tried to actually overtake it before World War II. And they actually had a tree of somewhat of an alliance with I Nazi say, Germany. I, I looked it up and then there was an anti-communist thing that they signed. Yeah. So they, I had to like attacked. think about it a little bit, but yeah, they actually had somewhat of an alliance with they ended, like, Germany. The USSR at the same time, Germany did try to get behind that. After. Well, yeah.